in the hands of Anthony. Anthony for three. Puts it in. Next by one with 8.2 remaining. Ah, uh, Carmelo Anthony. One of the greatest scorers of his generation. The smoothness of his jump shots, the notoriety of his iconic jab step, the loudness of his screams every time he gets a rebound. Take advantage of. Melo is and was a truly unique and unorthodox player. On one end, he's known as a fantastic scorer back in his prime, one of the most pleasing players to watch in the history of the game. On the other hand, he's known for his lackadaisical defense, his selfishness, and his inability to carry his teams deeper into the playoffs. Prime Melo was a spectacle to watch, but there were unquestionably some negative aspects of his game that were observed under a microscope. And perhaps in recent years, towards the end of his career, he's gotten more flack than most other waning stars. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, let's talk about Prime Mello. How good was he actually? What years were considered his prime? And what are the misconceptions that surround this bona fide superstar? But before I start, I'd like to give a shout out to my sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers a wide array of classes, a ton of self-discovery and a sense of fulfillment. Learning is essential in times of hardship to get your mind focused on a goal that you want to accomplish. It offers classes that include illustration, graphic design, web development, marketing, creative writing, and much, much more. I love typography and digital illustration, so I'd recommend this class by Jeanette Liao. Skillshare is very affordable and helpful for your own future endeavors. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get two free months of premium membership, so you can explore your creativity. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. First, we gotta define when Melo was actually in his prime. He's had a few seasons where he played at his absolute peak. But generally speaking, I'd say his prime ranges between 2006 and 2014, between the ages of 21 and 29. These were his 8 or 9 seasons where he was at his best. On an individual basis, he matched up very well with his peers, especially LeBron James. Overall, prime LeBron was clearly the superior player, but when they went head to head, it was always quite intense. From 03 until 2012, Melo had a winning record versus LeBron in head-to-head -head matchups, with 9 wins and 6 losses. What made him special was that he was incredibly versatile with his scoring arsenal. He could take you off the dribble, shoot a pull-up jumper in your face, go into his triple threat position and lull you to sleep with his 5 billion jab steps. He could shoot threes, although not amazingly, but good enough to the point where you can't just leave him open and go under screens. He had the fadeaway, the drop step, and the spin moves. Offensively, there was nothing he couldn't do. Well, except for passing. For a long time, there was a huge discussion about who was the better scorer, Prime Melo or Prime LeBron. It usually came down to the fact that LeBron was the more efficient scorer, but Melo had such a wide array of different moves that made him nearly impossible to guard, as he was a threat to score regardless of where he was on the floor. From 2006 until 2014, he averaged over 26 points per game, over 6 rebounds, 3 assists on good percentages. But maybe the more impressive part is that he led his teams to the playoffs for 10 consecutive seasons. One of the biggest misconceptions is that he wasn't a team player, but it's not like his teams were losing, they were doing very well. Right when he came into the NBA, he was the major factor in turning around the Nuggets franchise. Previously, they were a bottom-dwelling team, winning only 17 games in the year before he got drafted. Unfortunately, in 7 full seasons in Denver, they only managed to get out of the first round once. That was in 2009, where Chauncey Billups was the best player on the team, not Melo. 
That's another thing. Over the years, when people look back at Mello's time in Denver, it's a mixed bag. Some blame him for not adapting or being too selfish, and he's the reason that his teams were held back. Others believe he entered the league at a bad time. The Western Conference was at the strongest it's ever been. While the Nuggets were a great team, they had a ridiculously tough matchup in every round. They simply weren't as good as the Spurs or Lakers, who eliminated Melo's Nuggets in four of their seven playoff runs. However, if you dive deeper into the stats, maybe a huge portion of the blame should go to Melo. In his seven seasons in Denver, Melo only led his team in win shares just once. That was in the 2005-06 season. In every other season, someone else on his team was the leader in win shares. Now, I know win shares is not the perfect stat, but it does take into account his value to the team. Statistically, they were not much better with him on the floor versus him on the bench. In fact, from 2007 to 2010, the Nuggets had a better offensive and defensive rating without Melo. The numbers were close, but Melo stagnated the offense when he was on the floor, largely due to his pitiful assist rate. The offense flowed much better with other players getting more touches, like Nene, or Billups, or even J.R. Smith, who, believe it or not, didn't hog the ball nearly as much as Melo. Basically, despite all the playoff appearances, there were serious flaws with Melo's game. And these flaws would carry over to the New York Knicks. In an article from The Cauldron, Dan Favale explains Melo's demeanor pretty well here. He stated, He seems overtly aware of his reputation, yet he's self-defeating in the way he seemingly prioritized money over everything else. He is generally recognized as a superstar, yet there is still a widely held belief that he's not good enough, not worthy enough, not interested enough regardless of his on-court brilliance. Melo could have joined the Knicks during the 2011 offseason when he was a free agent, but instead, he wanted to be traded there in the middle of the season. Partly because he wanted to sign an early three-year extension, which allows the Knicks to sign him to an even bigger contract later in 2014, due to having Melo's bird rights. And this eventually did happen. It's also partly because the Knicks felt threatened that Melo would sign with their rivals, the Nets. So they pulled the trigger on this massive trade, which saw them give up a ton of quality young players and assets. It would come back to bite them, but for now, the Knicks retooled their team around Melo. By the 2012-13 season, Melo would have the greatest season of his entire career. He led the league in scoring with a career-high 28.7 points a game. He developed into a great leader, Vocally, he was more active than any other season of his career. Not only that, but he also moved to power forward and dominated his new position. We saw Melo take on a true leadership role on a team that was very old. In fact, the Knicks were the third oldest team in the league with an average age of 30.2. But with age comes experience. When it comes to pace, the Knicks dropped from 5th to 26th. Coach Mike Woodson implemented a more methodical approach offensively, since it suited their cast of older players better. As a result, the Knicks won 54 games and grabbed the second seed in the Eastern Conference. This Knicks Heat playoff matchup was heavily anticipated, as they were expected to meet in the Conference Finals. However, in the second round, it all came crashing down. In arguably the most sluggish series of the playoffs, the Knicks fell in six games. Melo was the only good Knicks player in the series, but that was the Pacers' plan. They let Melo play one-on-one -on -one while shutting down everyone else. It worked because he got tired and he can't score every single time. Unsurprisingly, the Knicks would not make the playoffs again for the rest of the Carmelo Anthony era. This roster of players was simply unsustainable because they were way too old. Jason Kidd was 39 years old and retired right after the season. Rashid Wallace and Marcus Camby were 38 and also retired. 
Kurt Thomas was 40 and he retired too. Kenyon Martin was at the twilight of his career, also retiring two years later. Tyson Chandler was on the downswing of his career and rapidly fell off. And Amari Stoudemire's knees exploded and he never recovered. After this, Melo continued to play at an elite level for the next few years, but by the age of 30, his prime was over. So how good was Prime Melo actually? Well, certainly a top 10 player for a few years in Denver, a top 5 player with the 2013 New York Knicks, arguably a top 10 small forward of all time, certainly a Hall of Famer. But at the same time, his tunnel vision and his unwillingness to pass the ball would be a detriment to his own team. In Denver and in New York, his teams would routinely finish in the bottom 10 in assists. His efficiency as an ISO player did not make up for the lack of ball movement. This would change as he got older though, as he slowly became a more willing passer. But at that point, it was too late. Defensively, oh boy, it was a nightmare. His reputation of being a poor defender never went away, and as he got older, it became even worse. Funny enough, Melo probably calls out more defensive rotations and telling teammates where to go more often than actually rotating himself. 20 or 30 years from now, fans will look back at Melo in the same vein as we look back today at a guy like Dominique Wilkins. An absurdly talented scorer, but heavily flawed in other areas. As a result, both of them struggled to have playoff success, cause opposing teams always took advantage of their flaws. I think it's a fair historical comparison. Anyway, that's all folks, that sums up how good Prime Mello actually was. Let me know your thoughts on him and where would you rank him all time? Do you also think he's a top 10 small forward ever? Do you think he truly reached his full potential? Let me know in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. And as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.